we'll get started. <laughs> okay. I am super excited for tonight. I want to thank everyone for joining Darien Library this evening for New England's Other Witch Hunt with Walt Woodward. We're graced today by Walt W. Woodward, who's the fifth person to hold the position of state historian, which was created in the 1930s in preparation of Connecticut's 300th anniversary. Um, the state historian is appointed by the trustees of the University of Connecticut and is a faculty member of the UConn Department of History. So we are lucky to have Walt with us. Before I begin, I'd like to discuss or mention that programs at Darien Library are made possible by the annual Friends of the Library campaign. We thank you for your support to make programs like this as well as our collections available to the community. I hope everyone's excited to learn about this topic and now I'm gonna pass the mic over to Walt. Thank you so much. And thank you for coming out. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's fall, it has finally cooled off. And I don't know what happens the minute the first leaf turns historically for me, people start thinking about witches and, and this is a topic I very much like to talk about. Uh, what I'm going to do with your permission is I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. The, one of the reasons I love to talk about witchcraft is because uh, people know so much, or whenever they, we think about witches, we of course think about Salem and the witch trials of 1692. But what most people don't know too much about is the long history of witch hunting in Connecticut and uh, the very interesting twists and turns that happened there. So with your permission, that's what I'm going to talk about. And I'll stop talking about what I'm going to talk about and start talking about the talk. So here we go. Here we are. Thanks to the vast output of writing that was generated both when they happened and through the centuries that followed, the witch trials at Salem, Massachusetts in 1692 and 93 represent for most people the sum total of witch hunting in America. This is unfortunate, for that late 17th century cataclysm was preceded by a longer and equally troubling period of colonial witch hunting that has, for the most people, gone all but unnoticed. I encountered this comparatively hidden history of New England witch hunts while researching a book about this man, John Winthrop Jr., one of the most important figures in colonial America, and of special interest to me, a deeply committed Christian alchemist whose alchemical beliefs and practices deeply informed his approaches to colonial settlement. The story I'd like to share with you this evening is about that earlier period of witch hunting and the pivotal role John Winthrop Jr. played in moderating its successes and ultimately ending its deadly reign of terror. I've titled it The Alchemy of Justice, John Winthrop Jr. and New England's Other Witch Hunt. You know, it's surprising, but the first witch execution in New England took place not in Massachusetts, but here, in the neighboring colony of Connecticut, and not in 1692, but in 1647, 45 years before Salem began. Unlike the Salem trials, about which so much has been written, we wouldn't know anything about the first New England witch death, except for two sentences in two different documents produced 100 miles away from each other and found some 250 years apart. Sometime between March and May 1647, Massachusetts Governor John Winthrop Sr., the father of the man I'm going to talk about tonight, whose journal history of New England is one of our most important historical sources from this period, wrote in that journal the following sentence. One, and he left a blank, of Windsor arraigned and executed at Hartford for a witch. Winthrop left the blank space intending, no doubt, to add the witch's name once he'd received further information. But for the next 257 years, that's all that was known. Some person who lived in Windsor was tried for witchcraft in Hartford and then executed. 
What was she charged with? Who conducted the trial? Who testified against her? What was her defense? Where was she hanged? None of this was known. In truth, historians didn't even know whether New England's first convicted witch was a man or a woman. Then in 1904, Annie Elliott Trumbull, the daughter of Connecticut's first state librarian, announced that she had come into possession of a worn sheepskin binding containing the manuscript colonial diary of Windsor resident Matthew Grant, in which he had written that on May 26, 1647, Alice Young was hanged. Finally, after two and a half centuries, it was confirmed that New England's first executed witch was, as supposed, a woman, and that her name was Alice Young. And though we know so little about her, Alice Young's death launched a period of witch hunting that has both important similarities to and differences from the better known witch hunt at Salem. These comparative differences are really revealing. Between 1647 and 1692, the 45 year period before the Salem hunt, 57 people were brought, brought to trial in New England on charges of witchcraft. Their trials produced 16 convictions, four confessions, and 16 executions. During the two-year Salem witch hunt, 156 people were accused. Their trials produced 30 convictions, 44 confessions, and 19 executions. Now, at first glance, when you compare these two, you compare the early 45-year period of witch hunting with the Salem trials, it seems to indicate <clears throat> that you're really looking at two distinctly different experiences. If you average out the number of early executions against their 45-year time span, it would suggest that during this early period, witch hunting was a way, kind of a, a, a way of keeping people in check. Uh, that about once every four or five years, there would be a show trial that would result in a conviction and execution, and that that would serve as a cautionary tale for the rest of society, especially its women. Now at Salem, on the other hand, witch hunting simply raged out of control for a year or two, reached a crisis, and then ended permanently. The difference between the two periods, if you do the math, seem really striking. However, if you map out the trials and executions by their exact dates and locations, as I did in my research, what you see is a very different story. All the people hanged for witchcraft in the early period were executed not during a 45-year interval, but rather during the 16-year period between 1647 and 1663. That was followed by a 25-year interval without a single execution anywhere in New England. And then it was succeeded by the 1688 hanging of a confessed, confessed witch named Goody Glover in Boston, and that set the stage for the nightmare at Salem. In reality, there were two periods of intense witch hunting in New England, separated by a whole generation without a single execution. And that wasn't the only surprise that the data revealed. During this early period of witch hunting, Connecticut proved to be much, much harsher, harsher in its treatment of suspected witches than Massachusetts. Between 1647 and 1654, Massachusetts acquitted half of the people it brought to trial for witchcraft. In Connecticut, all seven of the people charged during this period were convicted and hanged. Whereas in Massachusetts, a person had a 50-50 chance of gaining their freedom to be indicted for witchcraft in Connecticut during those early years was simply a death sentence. But what exactly did people fear from the suspected witches in their midst? What made someone who had been a neighbor for years suddenly so dangerous that community safety made executing them mandatory. From our perspective, 
it's easy to see that misogyny and, and an effort to suppress women's power underpinned witchcraft accusations. But there's a problem there. That can also make it easy to forget that early modern people also truly and deeply believed that witches' magical powers were very real, very strong, and with the devil's help, they could be very, very dangerous. Witches possessed a battery of magical powers that could be applied in a range of harmful, sometimes fatal ways. All these forms of harmful magic, the ability to make someone fall in or out of love with another person, the ability to change the weather, the power to make an animal sick or lame or even die, to cast maggots into the cheese or to spoil the cider, to appear in the image of someone or something else, to usurp divine authority and predict the future, and most commonly to magically inflict sickness or injury. All of these could, in the subsistence agrarian economies of the early modern world, pose existential threats to the security of family and communities. And people were terribly afraid of this kind of malefica and the people who could deploy it. In this engraving, which is a European engraving from the late 1500s, what you see are two witches brewing up a storm cycle. That's uh, practicing weather magic, a very frightening thing when you depended on your crops to actually survive. Early modern people lived in a world where virtually every living person truly believed in magic. Their universe was filled with a cult, a word that literally means unseen, hidden forces. These unseen forces emanated from the stars, the planets, God and his angels, the devil and demons, stones, metals, and plants. Occult influences were everywhere. A witch, with the devil's help, became a master at harnessing and focusing these occult forces in ways that could inflict terrible harm across a range of different uh, activities. Witches' efforts, though perhaps not their goals, were not that different from those of the early modern alchemists, the top scientists of their day who sought prayerfully and with God's help to use the rudimentary existing scientific methods and their own understandings of magic to harness these same occult forces, not just to make gold, which is what most people think alchemists were doing, but also to achieve a wide and almost you know, incomprehensible number of potential advances, all of which were focused on improving the lives of all humanity. And, and these Christian alchemists that I've studied also hope that their practice would trigger the onset of the millennium, the time when Christ was supposed to return to earth and reign for a thousand years. Such an approach to science, this which really was in this period, a fusion of lab work, intense prayer and magic all in pursuit of goals that were both extremely practical and simultaneously religious. This well, seems you today You're froze. weird, irrational. We're going to give them a minute. But we live in a world that has established solid firewalls that distinctly and markedly and separate if he doesn't religion come back right away. and science and magic. Each has its own isolated sphere of operation with virtually no overlap or interface among them. But that's not how early modern people saw the, these things working. Uh, it's, in fact, it's the exact opposite of how early moderns viewed the relationship between religion, science, and magic. For them, religion, science, and magic were inseparable. They were woven together like a DNA spiral helix, so interdependent that you couldn't tease them apart or believe in the influence of one unless you accepted the vitality of the others. Without magic, no religion. Without religion, no science. And so 
everyone in the world of the witch hunts believed in and truly feared the awesome power of diabolical magic to do evil. That's something that's easy to forget in our modern world, but it's something that shaped so many of the activities that we struggle to understand in this time period. In Connecticut, that meant that for any person charged with witchcraft between 1647 and 1655, there simply was no escape. Each was convicted and each was hanged. That pattern of unyielding persecution of witch suspects by Connecticut began to change in the year 1655 through the efforts of one person, John Winthrop Jr., a man of multifaceted capability. Winthrop served as governor of Connecticut for 19 years. He was the founder of three towns, Ipswich, Massachusetts, and Saybrook and New London in Connecticut. Winthrop was an industrial entrepreneur who built a technologically advanced ironworks in New England when the region was still almost completely a wilderness. He was also New England's most sought after physician. Winthrop's medicines and his healing powers based on alchemy were considered so effective that people wrote him from the West Indies and Europe seeking medical advice and the people of New England flocked to him for medical care. New, Un New London, which he founded, was really New England's first hospital town. It was the Mayo Clinic of the 17th century. Winthrop was the leading scientist in colonial North America too, and a founding member of England's Royal Society. Today, still one of the world's leading scientific institutions. Now, Winthrop was all these things and capable of doing all these things because he was first and foremost an alchemist, a, a man dedicated to employing an alchemical blend of science, religion, and magic to harness the occult forces permeating nature to do God's work in the world. Winthrop founded New London as an alchemical research center, and he traveled through Europe, recruiting other alchemists to come to New London and join him in the alchemical suit, pursuit of godly perfection. The very name New London which the Connecticut Assembly thought was so brash in its ambitions that they rejected the use of it on two different occasions. But that name reflects the scope of Winthrop's vision for this new town in a new world and his belief in the transformative power of alchemy. As an alchemist and himself a practitioner of the occult and a student of natural magic, Winthrop was considered by his peers a truly reliable authority on the various uses of magic. And because he was from a leading Puritan family and he had impeccable political and religious credentials, he was for the most part above suspicion regarding his own magical pursuits. So as early as 1655, when there were suspicious cases involving accusations of magic and witchcraft in Connecticut, this was before he was a governor, magistrates would still turn to Winthrop to uh, seek his help in determining whether these suspicions of witchcraft were justified. Now, once Winthrop became involved in Connecticut witchcraft cases, witchcraft prosecution in Connecticut changed dramatically. From 1655 to 1661, after executing every suspected witch it had prosecuted before that time, no person accused of witchcraft in Connecticut colony faced even conviction. That's because as a consultant in these cases, Winthrop pursued a very effective and interesting strategy. He consistently found grounds for suspicion of witchcraft, uh, an act which validated the fears of the accusers but at the same time, he never found confirmation that the suspect had actually used diabolical magic, which saved the accused from conviction. 
Connecticut's pattern of prosecution and conviction that had resulted in all those deaths was effectively stalled by Winthrop, who, once he was elected governor of the colony in 1657, gained a great deal of additional authority over the legal process. But unfortunately, the break that Winthrop's influence put on witch prosecution was only temporary. In 1661, Connecticut sent Winthrop to England on what could best be described as an emergency diplomatic mission. England had restored the monarchy in 1660 and installed Charles II, son of the king the Puritans had beheaded 11 years before back on the English throne. The New England colonies were worried, none more than Connecticut. They had not only supported the war against the new monarch's father, they were harboring several of the regicides, the men who had signed King Charles I's death warrant. Connecticut was in this particularly vulnerable position since it had been founded without royal permission and had never received a royal charter. Faced with the possibility of an angry king uh, embarking on a royal takeover, Winthrop was sent to England to try to smooth things over with the king and if possible, secure Connecticut a royal charter. This was a tall order, but there was no alternative at the time. And so Winthrop sailed for England in the summer of 1661. Well, that was not a good thing for suspected witches. In Winthrop's absence, witchcraft trials began anew. In Hartford, in the middle of the night, an eight-year-old girl named Elizabeth Kelly awoke in excruciating pain. She screamed for her father, and she told him that Goody Ayers, a woman known for spreading stories of encounters with the devil, that Goody Ayers was tormenting her. She begged her father over and over again to send for the magistrates to get them to arrest Goody Ayers and make, him, make her stop hurting the girl. Her father, thinking it was an illness, resisted the child's pleading, but she continued her accusations against Goody Ayers throughout a two week long illness. And when finally Elizabeth Kelly died, saying with her last words, Goody Ayers chokes me. Her father broke down and did send for the magistrates and all hell broke loose in Hartford. Kelly's death unleashed a torrent of witchcraft executions. New witchcraft victims screamed their presence as the Hartford witch hunt saw a year of panic that produced eight witchcraft trials in as many months. The colony was riveted by fear that it was under diabolical assault as witnesses were deposed, suspects interrogated, and trials set. The trials themselves became mesmerizing performances of social pathology where without an authoritative moderating presence like Winthrop, witch haters had a field day. Rejecting guidelines by English authorities that it not be used, two accused persons in Hartford trials were subjected to the water test. In this test, suspects were bound hand to toe, and then they were dropped into water, most likely the nearby Connecticut River, to see whether they would float or sink. If they floated, they were deemed guilty. If they sank without surfacing, they were innocent. Now, this sounds just absolutely crazy when we think about it. How could they do this? What, what were they thinking? But it's only crazy if you're a modern person. The theory behind the test was completely consistent with the world of the witch hunters. The theory was magical, but with a spiritual foundation. And it made sense in a world where religion, science, and magic were inseparably intertwined. And here was the logic that said, the witch sinking showed she was innocent, the witch floating showed she was guilty. What they reasoned scientifically was that since a witch had, 
in making a covenant with the devil, rejected the waters of her baptism, now the waters would reject the witch and they would cause her or him to float to the surface if put to this test. In Hartford, both of the suspects failed the test and then fled the colony before their prosecution continued because they were absolutely certain that they would die. They had good reason to flee. The ministers and the magistrates leading the prosecution were unstanting in the zeal with which they pressed their cases. Suspects were verbally abused, harangued. They were browbeaten in the effort to wrest confessions with them. And, you know, you'd think, what, what, what the heck? What, just what's going on here? Why are these educated, powerful, wealthy men, in many cases, being so incredibly harsh with these elderly, innocent, sometimes uh, certainly adult women. And the manuals that told them how to conduct witch trials told them to do exactly that because what they said was this, don't look at that, that old woman and think that she's a weak, fragile, frail person. Oh no, if she is allied with the devil, then standing next to her unseen to you is the most powerful force in the world next to God. And compared to him, you are nothing. So attack, attack, attack. And that's what they did. The surviving fragments of paper that summarize witnesses' testimony, they, uh, they reveal the excruciating drama of these court proceedings that often were acted out in front of the entire community crowded into this courtroom. So the humiliation you faced, the antagonism you faced, you faced before everyone you had ever known. Under interrogation by Joseph Haynes, the lewd, ignorant, and considerably aged, that's from the transcript, Rebecca Greensmith became so enraged at the way he was questioning her that she said she could have torn him in pieces. And she went on, she was much resolved as might be to deny her guilt. But Haynes kept at it. He pounded away and he pounded away. And under this relentless assault, Greensmith finally crumbled. She said she felt as if her flesh had been pulled from her bones. And so she couldn't deny any longer. Now, her subsequent confession, this one sentence, provides such an incredible indication of the salacious nature of her interrogation for what she confessed to, what she admitted. And you can see the questions that would set this up. She did admit that yes, the devil had had frequent use of her body with much seeming delight to her. Imagine the kind of questioning that could have produced that response. Well, by the time John Winthrop Jr. returned to Hartford in June of 1663, Four people, Mary Sanford, Rebecca Greensmith, her husband, Nathaniel, and Mary Barnes of Farmington, they'd already been hanged. As many as five others, certain they were heading for execution, had fled the colony, forfeiting all their possessions, and in one case, abandoning young children. One man had been acquitted, and another suspect, Elizabeth Seeger, had been narrowly acquitted once but she was already charged with witchcraft a second time. Winthrop, I am certain, must have been just dumbfounded and certainly disheartened at how far his more cautious approach to witchcraft pr prosecution had been superseded in his absence. But as the returning governor and a man who had succeeded in securing a royal charter from Charles II, and an incredibly favorable one at that, Winthrop came back with a great deal of political and social capital at his disposal, and he immediately put it to work to take control over the witch hunt. Winthrop appears to have engineered a compromise with Seeger's accusers that once again found her not guilty of witchcraft, 
but guilty of the lesser charge of adultery. Now, why would this be good for Seeger? Because if she was convicted of witchcraft, she would have been executed, but convicted of adultery, she would have just been whipped with a cat of nine tails. Well, a strong-willed and shark tum woman, Seeger was having none of it. She insisted the accusations against her were a great deal of hodgepodge. Now, she's tough. I really admire Elizabeth Seeger, but she put Winthrop in a really difficult position. And frankly, he must have expended a tremendous amount of his authority, but he was able to get her off. To little avail, Seeger continued to antagonize her neighbors and she was indicted yet a third time for continuing to practice witchcraft in the spring of 1665. And this time her accusers were determined to get a conviction. So Winthrop allowed them to get one. He remained away from her trial. Now it's interesting, as governor, he could have presided over it and he was expected to serve as the chief prosecutor, but he just, he stayed away. And when the expected guilty verdict was returned, that's when Winthrop acted. He simply refused to enforce it. At a special meeting of the governor and magistrates, he declared Seeger's conviction obscure and ambiguous to him, and he deferred sentencing to a later date. Then he waited nearly a year until judicial reforms he had had written into the royal charter went into effect. Those reforms gave the governor power to impose, alter, change, or annul any penalty and to release or pardon any offender. Winthrop then set Seeger free from further suffering or imprisonment. For the first time in Connecticut history, a convicted witch did not hang. Now, why was Winthrop himself a magic practitioner so much more reluctant than many of his contemporaries to support witchcraft convictions. Winthrop, a very astute politician, was careful never to put his reasons in writing, but from his voluminous correspondence to other alchemists and his own behavior, I've read literally hundreds and hundreds of Winthrop letters. One infers that Winthrop was not inherently opposed to the practice of natural magic, and he didn't share many of his contemporaries' fears about women having access to such knowledge. In England, he had employed his cousin, Elizabeth Phones, as an alchemical research assistant, and, and he had praised her ability to friends and other alchemists. Experience had made him less likely to see diabolical involvement behind a woman's quest for magical knowledge. And he was certainly not prepared to kill someone because of it. Whatever his reasons, Winthrop never wavered in his commitment to protecting accused witches from unwarranted executions. And after his return, many of Connecticut's magistrates followed Winthrop's lead in exercising forbearance in witchcraft cases. But that's only half the story. Many of the ordinary people in Connecticut weren't very happy with what had happened in the Seeger case. They were still convinced witchcraft was dangerous and they truly believed their communities were under assault from the devil. As much as they admired their charter winning governor and this medical expert they relied on, some people wondered after the Seeger case though probably in whispers, just why the alchemical governor was so soft on witchcraft prosecution. Now, these tensions, these bubbling subsurface tensions over how suspected witchcraft assault should be handled came to a head in the 1669 case of Catherine Harrison. This was the pivotal case in the transformation of witchcraft prosecution in Connecticut. Harrison was an outspoken Weathersfield medical practitioner, astrologer, and widow who had risen from being a servant in her youth to becoming a person of substantial means. 
In May of 1668, Harrison's neighbors began collecting depositions that charged her with several forms of witchcraft, inflicting illness leading to death, shape-shifting and appearing in spectral form, and astrologically defining the future. She was accused of magically causing the death on separate occasions of three people, two of them children. One witness reported seeing her as a black dog in the moonlight. Another saw her as a calf's head, which morphed into Harrison herself in a hay cart. And yet a third saw her as a dog-like thing, but a dog with Harrison's head walking to and fro in the observer's bedroom. Several people reported Harrison making numerous astrological predictions of future events from who you would marry to future sicknesses and death. By the time Harrison was formally indicted, more than 30 witnesses had uh, legally sworn testimony against her. At her trial, apparent challenges to their testimony offered by Winthrop and the magistrates resulted in the jury being unable to reach a verdict. So Harrison was ordered imprisoned until the court met again the following October, when the jury would be reconvened, reconvened to render a decision. Now, this first trial was in March. The October trial was six months away. So Winthrop, on his own accord, apparently, ordered Harrison released from jail and held under house arrest in Wethersfield. This provoked outraged, outraged cries of protest from the people who lived in this deeply frightened and very angry community. 37 Wethersfield residents, including two ministers and the local physician, joined together to sign a petition protesting Harrison's release and demanding her immediate incarceration. If you wanna see a document that shows how seriously people took witchcraft and how much they feared it, it's this petition. In the petition, they also demanded that Harrison's prosecution be taken away from Winthrop, who would have handled it as the colony's governor. They wanted it handled by the colony's foremost lawyer, a man named Blackleach, who, unlike Winthrop, could be trusted to press the case without favoring Harrison. Clearly, Winthrop has overplayed his hand. He's overstepped his bounds. People are now looking at him differently than just as the governor with all this alchemical knowledge. That question of why is he so soft on witchcraft is now bothering a lot of people. Releasing Harrison had not only called into question his impartiality, it less directly perhaps raised serious questions about Winthrop's own magical practices. When the jury reconvened on October 12, 1669, they found Catherine Harrison guilty. But once again, as in the case of Elizabeth Seeger, Winthrop would not let the conviction stand. Now, his personal views on witchcraft at this point in time were so suspect that he couldn't simply reject the verdict as he did in the Seeger case. He was forced into probably the last resort for a Puritan governor. This happened very rarely in New England, but once in a while, a governor would find himself uh, with his subjects so angry at him that he needed a like a release valve from the pressure cooker. And uh, this was the last resort and Winthrop used it. Before passing sentence on Harrison, the Winthrop court asked a triumvirate of Puritan ministers to weigh in on a number of questions. But the most important one is what evidentiary standards are necessary to convict in a witchcraft case? Now, they turned it over to ministers because the ministers could study the Bible and come back with the most godly uh, interpretation of what was right. The, minister, the ministerial group that Winthrop pulled together 
to answer this question was headed by a man named Gershom Bulkley, also of Wethersfield, where Catherine Harrison was from. But most importantly, Bulkley was a very good friend of uh, John Winthrop Jr. Bulkley was not only a close friend, he was also, like Winthrop, a physician and an alchemist. Bulkley had studied alchemy under Winthrop's direction, and he shared both Winthrop's interest in natural magic and his skepticism toward witchcraft allegations. So Bulkley was the leader of this synod that was to provide this evidence on the standards necessary to convict witches, and he also wrote the response. He delivered the opinion. His answer to Winthrop's question about the evidence necessary to convict a suspected witch was tailor-made to help Winthrop overturn Harrison's conviction. But it worked through a change so subtle, it went all but unnoticed by historians for many years. And I, I just love this because it's such a brilliant use of the law to uh, accomplish something perhaps that was different than what the law intended. Witchcraft under English law was a capital crime. A capital crime is any crime punishable by death. And any capital crime under English law required two eyewitnesses to the act in order to convict. If you didn't have a second witness, it was simply one person's word against another's. And that the English law had said for centuries was simply insufficient proof to take away someone's life. But in witchcraft cases, the two witness rule because of the magical and occult nature of witch, witchcraft itself, the two witness rule had long been interpreted loosely. Thus, a person who, for example, uh, had been told by the accused of a future event that came true, they could be the first witness to someone's witchcraft. While a second person who saw the accused appear as a calf on a hay cart could be the second witness even though the two people had actually observed two completely different events. They were both magic, and so they were both signs of witchcraft, and that was enough to convict. The ministers were asked whether this flexible approach to the two witness rule in witchcraft cases was valid. Bulkley's response was simple, but profoundly important. It called for applying the exact same standards used in other capital cases to witchcraft. And it had a long involved explanation of how dangerous witchcraft was, how it needed to be stopped, how it was everyone's duty to crush witchcraft in its tracks. But at the same time it said that, it said a witchcraft conviction could only be valid if there were two witnesses to the same act at the same time the exact same time. And this, uh, while it seemed to reaffirm long held standards for capital conviction, what it did in fact was dramatically contract the grounds for convicting any accused witch. That's because the spectral apparitions, the familiars, the other supernatural encounters people reported in witchcraft cases almost always appeared to them when they were alone. They gained credence after the person went and told it to others and it made the, the rumor mill. But witchcraft was a psychological crime and it began in people's heads, usually in the dark, usually when they were alone. Based on the minister's finding, Catherine Harrison was freed after making an agreement with Winthrop that she would leave the colony. More importantly, once the new standards for conviction and his underlying caution regarding witchcraft accusations were accepted by others, witch killing in New England ended for a generation, 25 years without an execution. It wasn't until 1692 when in, an entire group of teenage girls and the public watching them 
publicly writhe in which inflicted agony in a Salem, Massachusetts meeting house, only then when people could see, when a whole town could be witness to these acts of witchcraft at the same time, only then uh, was the two witness rule fully met in a witchcraft case again. And once that happened, the consequences were so horrific that the ensuing tragedy in Salem has become the icon of American witch hunting. In Connecticut, however, witch killing was over. Connecticut had been transformed from New England's fiercest prosecutor of witches to the colony that would never kill another witch. And it, this was done a generation before the Salem nightmare began. The irony of Connecticut's great shift in attitudes toward accused witches is that it was brought about by a governor who himself knew the occult firsthand, who practiced natural magic, and who understand personally the limits of what magic could do. Together with a minister and protege who shared his practice and understanding of the occult, these two men implemented a minor change in a legal interpretation that put a permanent end to a terrible state-sanctioned punishment, at least here in Connecticut. And that's my witchcraft story for, uh, for 2021. And what I'm gonna do now, if I can figure out how to do it, well, I hope I'm gonna stop sharing. <laughs> I can't, I have this dark screen, so I can't see. Hmm. It's still your last slide. Oh, I've got many more slides after this. <laughs> Help, I, I'm being haunted. <laughs> well, you know what? I, we can look at John I, I guess I'm thing. up here in the right corner. And I'll keep <laughs> I'll keep trying to figure out what's okay. going on here, so but we do have a question. Um, someone said that she was curious if you've researched the trial of Goody Knapp in Fairfield from 1653. She said it involves some well-known names, Roger Ludlow and Thomas Staples. It was her her um, ninth great grandmother was Lucy Pell, who was one of the women who's trying to get Goody Knapp to confess and name others. Pretty interesting. Uh you know, when th this is so sad, and it's what happens when you get old. When I researched this stuff, well, I, I wrote the book Prosperous America 10 years ago, and I went through all the Connecticut witchcraft trials, and I was I, I was on top of my game. If you said Goody <laughs> Knapp, I could tell you what she said in her trial. It's been a long time. It, it, I think, and maybe you can help me with this. The one thing I remember is Goody Knapp the one that, uh, I think it's Mary Staples, when she, was, when she was interrogated by the women, Mary Staples, after she died, kind of had a breakdown over her body yes. and how they had, yeah, that, that's one of the most horrifying, I mean, horrifying in, a, in, a, in an educational way that, this this woman, Mary Staples, after they had killed Elizabeth Knapp, she, she I, I think she just had a breakdown and was so furious that she kind of grabbed the body and said, look what you did to her. Look what you did to this woman. And it um, uh, it's See, a moment that once you read about it, it's very hard to ever forget. So that's what I that's what I remember most vividly. But if you have, please, if you have, if you if you have details to share, you know, click on that mute button and let us hear. <laughs> you can raise your hand, and I will I will uh, see what I can do. Um, another question was, how and when did the thinking that witchcraft existed was replaced with more modern thinking? This was a. This was a slow burn. In some ways, Salem is happening 
the Sagam trials in 1692 are, they're a kind of fulcrum. After that excess was over and people woke up with the hangover, they, they had a built-in caution against uh, jumping to conclusions about witchcraft. And that, that served as a breaking mechanism for a generation. During that generation, so many of the things that people thought were magic, they began to get scientific explanations for. And by, I mean, you still have people talking to other people about people they think are witches into the, the mid 1700s in New England. But there are, I, I think there may even have been an, a, a hearing for witchcraft into the 1760s or something, late, late, late. But by, by the time of the American Revolution, that's, you're not gonna have witchcraft anymore. Um, at least you're not gonna have the kinds of excesses. So it is it's between the 17th and the 18th century, maybe 1675 to 1750, that you really see this, this enchanted world of witchcraft begin to be replaced with a much more rational, uh, uh, less magical view of the world. Oh, um, the woman who was talking about Goody Knapp, she made another comment and said that, um, she said, if those are witches' teeth, then they are just like mine. Oh, and yeah. and. Uh, for people who don't know, this is one of the this is one of the most horrifying things about witchcraft accusations for me. If you were if you were just accused, a standard part of the investigation was for eight or nine of the leading and most respectable women in the town to uh, take the suspected witch into a room and strip off all of her clothes, and the nine people would assault that woman like like an ant colony, go over every inch of her body looking for something that looked like an extra nipple, you know, a mole, a growth, something, because it was believed that if someone was a witch, they would have a witch's tit, a witch's teat, which would be a place where the devil, when he was visiting her, would get nourishment. And when the devil wasn't there, the devil's familiars, a cat or a bat or, you know, a spectral figure, the go-between between between the witch and the devil would also get nourishment. This was an an English creation, this idea of the witch's teeth. And uh, these four searches, if you can imagine the trauma of what that would be like for a person, even if all charges were dropped, even if they said we didn't find anything, which was rare, just imagine what that would be like. Yeah. And that's what Goody Knapp was subjected to. And that's what uh, Mary Staples, I think it was Mary. Just and I'm, my thought is going like, what if you had, you know, not a healthy relationship or, you know, a bad relationship with one of the women on the, um, I guess you would say board, and they were, you know, purposely looking for something to get you in trouble. I'm sure oh, that's I, I, happened. I have colleagues at the University of Connecticut who would have me in the room in, <laughs> in a minute if they could. Yes, he's a witch. Go find that witch. Let's string him up. <laughs> I, you know, I here's what I think. I think these people were religious in a with an intensity, even a person who wouldn't have considered themselves religious in this period were religious with an intensity we would find that would make most of us very uncomfortable, mm -hmm. very uncomfortable. And they, they were true believers in the truest sense of that word. And because of that, this idea of bringing false charges, you know, of really just manipulating the system to kill, people might have done it, but you know, they were as worried about the wrath of God as about the harm of the devil. And, you know, I think that uh, that doesn't mean everybody was good. People were plenty bad, but they were 
they they thought twice before they made false charges. We have a few more questions. Someone wants to know, did John Winthrop Jr. serve as governor for many years longer or was he held in good esteem until the end of his death? And was he held in good esteem? It's really interesting. You in Connecticut, uh, in in the 1600s into I think the late 1700s, the governor stood for election every year. So John Winthrop Jr. was uh, he didn't he didn't run for office. He didn't ask for it. He didn't want to be it. He was elected in absentia in 1657. He agreed kind of under duress to take the job. During the year he was in England, someone else took it over and then he was reelected every year up until his death. Okay. So it, it, one of Connecticut's nicknames is the land of steady habits. And one of the steadiest habits was a, a, a tendency to reelect the same people to office over and over again. So by the time of the American Revolution, Connecticut was considered a, a, a state with a kind of middle-class aristocracy who ran things because it was the same families all the time. Someone wants to know how in the world could anyone ever be acquitted in this kind of hostile environment? Would it be um, through connections? See, that's, I mean, there, there was a case in Connecticut where Judith Varlet was accused in Hartford of being a witch. It turned out that her uncle, I think it was her uncle, maybe her father-in-law was Peter Stuyvesant, the governor of New York. And the governor of New York contacted Winthrop and you know used his influence to get a deal where she could get out of town before uh, the worst happened. So there are cases where people used influence to protect people, but, but not always. I do, having read this stuff, having studied these trials, I see two things going on. I see people trying very hard to follow the prescribed rules for conducting these trials and deciding convictions and all of those things. I think they really work to get it right, but it's hard not to see. So on the one hand, people got acquitted because the standards of evidence weren't sufficient to convict them, not, not just because Winthrop said so, but because they had a lot of other things. Many of the suspected cases of witchcraft died long before they got to indictment. Somebody would charge somebody with witchcraft, they'd have a hearing and they'd say, there's no evidence here. You know, you two kiss and make up, dude, get over it. The, but, but underneath it all, you can't look at this witchcraft without seeing there's a lot of, there's a lot of misogyny woven into this whether it's you know conscious or subconscious um it it's not just it's not just anti woman it's anti deviance it's anti deviance from the, from the accepted norms of a very religious and close packed social community there's a lot of that so winthrop winthrop very commonly would when he interceded to make sure someone wasn't convicted, he would also, if he couldn't get the community to kind of come back together, he would arrange, he'd make these side deals with the suspects to leave, to move someplace else. And, um, and they did. And, you know, that, that took care of the problem too. I was curious um oh, I lost my thought well when I was when I was first learning about witch trials when I was younger I always just thought it was because the women were were smarter than the men wanted them to be <laughs> they were speaking up and had ideas I, that they were like no not on our watch well I I you know 
some 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 of these people I read about are extremely smart. Catherine Harrison was a very smart woman. No question about it. I've also seen there there's a um there was a there was a woman in New Haven in the 1650s. I think her name was Elizabeth Goodman. And it is very clear from reading the, the accounts, the witnesses against her, that this is a woman who realized that if her neighbors thought she might be a witch, she could get a lot of stuff from them. She could go to them and say, can I have a pail of milk right now and get the pail of milk? And you see her working this system. And, and I think there are many people who kind of used, you know, they were skating along the border, but they kind of used this potential fear of uh, evil powers to get a lot of local power. The problem was that once in a while they crossed the line and then it was too late. There's a lot of that going on. And that is, you got to be smart to play that game, but you can get outsmarted pretty fast. Mm -hmm. I can see that. Um, someone wrote, I can imagine the women who are accused by men, um, they rejected advances from too. Oh, wow. Yeah, well, unless, you know, unless that world was completely different <laughs> from the world we're living in, like people weren't even people anymore. I'm sure stuff like that happened too. Um, she but, doesn't like me uh, in my mind it's like oh she doesn't like me that's because she likes the devil <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hey, if you can't like me obviously <laughs> you must you must you, you, how could you possibly i i you know all of these like almost any motive you can think of is can factor into these things it's what i love about studying these people in this time there, there isn't one cause for anything. There are always multiple causes. It's a cluster of things. Mm -hmm. And all of the reasons you can think of fit into that cluster. But all of the things that, many things that you just can't believe they'd think, like this religion, science, and magic being intertwined, that's a factor too. And a belief that this stuff is real is a factor too. These are not, I think part of the attraction of witchcraft is that it seems so crazy and it's easy for us to say, oh, I would never be like that. I'm, I'm a better person than that. Mm -hmm. But if you lived then, you would share those values. And, you know, you and I might be right there saying, hey, stop this woman, stop this woman before it's too late. You know, all those people in Wethersfield signing that petition, the 37 people, the two ministers, the physician, they all believed that releasing Catherine Harrison back into the community was the equivalent of releasing a terrorist. Wow. So, so yeah. it's something to think about. Make a point. Okay, two more questions. Um, and I know we we're beyond the eight o'clock, so I apologize, but this is just so fascinating. I want to keep you for a little bit longer, if that's okay. I'm Someone having was, fun. Thank you so much. If anybody needs to go, you, I mean, I know you will anyway, but jump off and <laughs> just know that I so appreciate your having me and thank you for your time. Thank you. Someone would like you to um, move your presentation to the screen where it shows your book. Can you put that slide up for us? We do have a copy of Walt's book. One, um, I'm not sure if we have all of the You books know, the, it, it, this is interesting. This book, Prosperous America, which has a detailed chapter on witchcraft mm -hmm. that tells this story, it's it tells it in an in a in an academic way. I think it's a pretty interesting story, but it's a pretty dense read as well. My most recent book, which is called Creating Connecticut, tells this story again. And I wrote this book to be for people who didn't know much about Connecticut history and might want to be interested in it. So creating Connecticut is a book for the rest of us. You don't have to be 
you know, a graduate student in history to read Creating Connecticut and get something out of it. And I tell the Connecticut witchcraft story in there in a way that I think is uh, a, a much, you know, an engaging read and much more accessible. So, And that is why we have you here because of that, those chapters. Well, and it's, and, and yeah, and it's wonderful to be here. So I would recommend if you really want to get into the nuts and bolts and have the footnotes that will show you where to go for more information, read Prospero's America. If you want to uh, get the overview and a good, a good history of witchcraft in Connecticut without that density, read Creating Connecticut. And it also has a section at the end of the chapter that points you to additional books to read. So one is, you know, 250 footnotes. The other one is two paragraphs of additional sources. And I know that we have Creating Connecticut in our collection at the library. I'm not Excellent. sure about your other book, but if not, we're going to buy that tomorrow. And put it Thank with you. Collection. Well, I, 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 uh, I hope you will. I'm very, I'm proud of both of these books and they were written to do completely different things. And I, you know, I would, I would like to think that I was successful at doing both of them, but you can tell me that. If you do <laughs> read either of them and like them, please do leave a review somewhere on Goodreads or someplace, because those mean so much. It, it, Prospero's America has been out for about 10 years now, and it's still selling pretty well. And that's because people who read it say they like it. Excellent. Oh, wonderful. I'm excited to give it a read. And I have one more question before we, we leave. Okay. Um, someone was curious if non-white women were accused and trialed as well. Oh, absolutely. Well, that's a, that, yes, yes. Not always in New England. You know, you, Tichaba Witch, who was, a, uh, who was a, an enslaved woman to Samuel Paris, who was the minister at the church in Salem or in what is now Danvers, Salem Village. There is a long story that she practiced, uh, that she practiced uh, uh, a kind of uh, uh, Caribbean folk magic, and that that really led to that that inspired the girls in Salem to come up with these witchcraft accusations. Now she was not uh, she she was not charged in the Salem trials, but. I do think she was punished for her role in this. I don't know in the English colonies in North America, I don't know of an African-American or an enslaved woman who was executed as a witch. It's a really interesting, it's a really interesting question because it was thought, you know, it, it, Indigenous people and unchristianized Africans were considered to be, you know, servants of the devil kind of innately because they hadn't become Christians. Uh, I've never seen it. I've never encountered it. I've never read anything about it. And now it's going to be on my radar till I find out for sure. Thank you for asking <laughs> that. And then just two compliments. Um, someone said, thank you for a great presentation. I was not aware of the period earlier than Salem. Very informative and passionate. And then um, Kate was um, saying, thank you for giving this presentation. She has a strong interest in New England witchcraft trials since she took a course um, on the Salem witch trials back in her freshman year of college. And she wrote her BA thesis on witchcraft in Connecticut. And she's pretty sure she used some of your sources. Oh, you're, that's you're... excellent. Well, if, you know, if you've got it there in an email file, Please send me a copy. Oh, I'd love to that'd read be it. So much fun. My Kate, email address. I have me. the shortest email address at the University of Connecticut. <laughs> it's Walt at Yukon, U C O N N dot E D U. If you if you want to send it along or if you have any follow up questions, please do. Um, please do send them along. Love to hear from you. Well, this has been incredible. We'll have to think about what our next topic will be because I could listen to you talk all day. <laughs> oh, you're so nice. Thank you so much. 
And thank you all for coming. It was really nice of you to take your time out this evening and uh, be with me when you could go be watching something really good on you know, Roku. <laughs> So, so thanks again. Thank you once more. And I, have a great I would sign week. off, but you're going to have to sign. Oh, yes, wait yes. a minute. Look. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> At last. I apologize. Earlier, my internet cut out, and I thought your internet cut out. So I'm glad that wow. got figured. I disappeared for a few moments. Oh. oh, that's great. Well, thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful night. And uh, it was so nice of you to have me.